As a series, Final Fantasy has always been defined by change, from the Famicom original in 1987, the spin-offs such as Mystic Quest and Final Fantasy Tactics, all the way to Final Fantasy X on the PlayStation 2, feature worlds, characters, and lore that were completely disassociated from every other entry. And while menu-driven RPG combat remained at the core of each, every game would also feature completely different gameplay systems surrounding how magic and other abilities were learned and used. But for all these differences, Final Fantasy was about to become even more different, with each entry becoming far more divisive among fans. This began with Final Fantasy XI, the series' first massively multiplayer online RPG, as well as Final Fantasy X-2, the first direct sequel to take place in the same world as a previous game, although with a marked change in tone. Final Fantasy XII, the final entry for PlayStation 2, continued to change things even more with a battle system that focuses more on designing your party's strategy than issuing moment-to-moment -moment commands. While many of us loved these very different Final Fantasies, others felt that the series was starting to go in a direction that they didn't want to follow. It is against this backdrop that Final Fantasy XIII, the prime entry of Square Enix's Fabula Nova Crystallis initiative, was released in Japan in late 2009. But with this being DF Retro's year of the PS Triple, and of course also being 13 years after that initial release, we feel that Final Fantasy XIII is due for reevaluation. As the PS360 generation got underway, there was definitely a sense that Japanese developers were not as well prepared for the HD era as Western developers. And as a result, games like Final Fantasy XIII took a very long time to make. When Final Fantasy XIII finally did arrive in Western markets in 2010, extremely popular open world games from developers such as Rockstar and Ubisoft were novel, and that type of experience is what many people were looking for with games going forward. So with its extreme linearity and limited opportunities for exploration, Final Fantasy XIII was clearly not dressed for the occasion. And while many of us did enjoy it quite a lot for what it was, popular opinion quickly pegged it as one of the worst mainline Final Fantasy games ever made, if not the worst. But today, when so many of us are now burnt out on the typical open world game formula, we think Final Fantasy XIII stands as a testament to what can be achieved when a game excises all the fat from its design and uses tried and true graphics techniques pushed to new heights rather than experimenting with newer rendering paradigms, which other developers were using to often poor results on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. In this regard, Final Fantasy XIII succeeds as a streamlined game that deploys exactly the right technology that was needed to live up to the concept art and meet its lofty visual targets for the lead PS3 platform, which resulted in a game that remains stunning to behold even to this day. And that's to say nothing of the full motion video sequences that arguably look better and run more smoothly than anything else that came before or since. But before we go any deeper, let's take a few steps back and look at where the development of Final Fantasy XIII began. Running high off of Final Fantasy X-2, the team working under producer Yoshinori Katase at the newly merged Square Enix decided to create a series of Final Fantasy games that were conceived to be loosely connected from the very beginning. Scenario writer Kazushige Nojima, most famous at the time for his work on Final Fantasy VII, VIII, and X, designed the core lore that would become known as the New Tale of the Crystal, Fabula Nova Crystallis in Latin. This includes the concept of the creator god Bunavelza, as well as the superhumans known as Lassi, who are blessed with magical abilities, but also cursed by the burden of an undesirable task. 
The initial set of games announced under the Fabula Nova Crystallis umbrella in 2006 were Final Fantasy XIII alongside the awkwardly titled Final Fantasy Agito 13 and Final Fantasy Versus 13. The idea wasn't so much that these games would be directly tied to Final Fantasy 13's story, but would be perhaps something closer to the Dragon Quest Zenithia trilogy, where a few common concepts exist across Dragon Quest 4, 5, and 6, which are otherwise completely unrelated games. Given that Agito 13 and Versus 13 ultimately shed the Final Fantasy 13 branding to become Final Fantasy Type 0 and Final Fantasy 15 respectively, I think it's fair to say that the Fabula Nova Crystallis concept was something of a failure. The Final Fantasy Agito name was later used in a mobile Type-0 spin-off, which was itself replaced by another mobile game called Final Fantasy Awakening, neither of which is still in service. Final Fantasy XIII's actual sequels, 13 2 and Lightning Returns, were presumably not part of the original plan either. So, yeah, the Fabula Nova Crystallis roadmap was pretty much thrown out the window for better or worse. But this wasn't the only internal initiative at Square Enix that failed to be as impactful across multiple games as originally intended. The push to create an all-new proprietary game engine for multi-platform development in the HD era hindered development on Final Fantasy XIII as well as other games in production at the time, including Final Fantasy XIV. The following year, during the announcement of Fabula Nova Crystallis, Final Fantasy XIII director Motomu Toriyama noted that development had begun on PlayStation 2, but ultimately moved to the PlayStation 3, after his team paused work on the game for six months to create the infamous Final Fantasy VII PlayStation 3 technical demo. While a true remake of Final Fantasy VII wouldn't arrive for another 15 years, this sequence showcases a level of detail and fluidity approaching Square's beloved pre-rendered CGI sequences featured in prior games. It set expectations for what a next-generation Square RPG might look like. One year later, Final Fantasy XIII itself was first shared with the public at E3 2006 with this bombastic trailer showcasing scenes that resemble but never actually made their way into the final game. At one point, a user interface mockup is overlaid suggesting that what we're seeing here represented the in-game visual target. In a post-mortem printed in Game Developer Magazine years later, however, it was revealed that this trailer represented nothing more than a visual concept for the game. Final Fantasy XIII was not yet playable in any form, and this trailer simply demonstrated the intended look and feel for the game that the team would go on to create. Unfortunately, the path to completion was long and fraught with many challenges. This new development platform powering Final Fantasy XIII was dubbed the White Engine and would later become known as Crystal Tools. Much of the company's technical talent was temporarily taken off Final Fantasy XIII and other projects to focus on Crystal Tools, causing significant delays and a lot of frustration in the process. This sort of hints at the challenges faced by Japanese developers during this era. When creating games for prior generation machines, it wasn't uncommon to build new technology specific to each new game project, but the shift to HD and more advanced rendering techniques made this a lot less feasible. Square Enix, along with companies such as Capcom, then focused their efforts on building tools and technologies that could be shared across platforms and games. Capcom's MT framework, which stemmed from their work on Onimusha 3 for PlayStation 2, believe it or not, was a tremendous success, powering many games even early in the generation. Crystal Tools, however, did not come together quite as well. During development, the engine team focused too heavily on building a cross-game toolset, something they'd never achieved before, and wound up bottlenecking themselves trying to field requests from all directions. As a result, progress was slow, which, combined with the challenges of working on PlayStation 3, resulted in further delays. Ultimately, Crystal Tools never really fully panned out, powering only Final Fantasy XIII, its two direct sequels, Dragon Quest X, and the doomed 1.0 version of Final Fantasy XIV. 
Naoki Yoshida, the producer and director who famously saved Final Fantasy XIV and spearheaded the development of version 2.0, noted that the aims of Crystal Tools were at odds with the needs of an online RPG. Dragon Quest X, which Yoshida worked on prior to 14, has a very simplistic visual design made with the Wii in mind. That said, it's hard to deny that it feels like a technical step back from even Dragon Quest VIII on the PlayStation 2. Crystal Tools may not be entirely to blame, of course, since some concessions would be expected for an online RPG, especially on the Wii. But it's also interesting to consider that the scope of the world in Dragon Quest X is significantly larger than Final Fantasy XIII itself. Surprisingly, the game still looks rather pleasing today on modern hardware such as the PlayStation 4 version running on a PS5 at 4K at 60 frames per second like this. Meanwhile, the Final Fantasy XIV engine from 2012 onward is more similar to the Luminous engine that was being built to power Final Fantasy XV. All this, combined with the downward trajectory in asset quality as Final Fantasy XIII sequels increasingly open up their gameplay, seems to suggest that the Crystal Tools were best suited to presenting a high level of graphical fidelity within a more constrained design, and that's precisely what Final Fantasy XIII offers. Even still, there was at least some hullabaloo surrounding the game's look in early previews compared to later screenshots that emerged as Final Fantasy XIII neared release. Yes, long before the likes of Puddlegate, the internet circa 2009 had a bit of a tiff over what you might call Necklace Gate or Shoulder Gate or perhaps even Armpit Gate. Indeed, it is clear from comparing early Final Fantasy XIII screenshots against the release game that at some point the visual targets were reduced, most noticeably in the areas of character geometry and the resolution of hair material. Adding fuel to the fire was the existence of the Xbox 360 version, which was announced at E3 2008. This triggered a now infamous post on the online forum NeoGAF expressing extreme displeasure over this new wrinkle. <laughs> Square just shot themselves in the foot. I don't know how much the rest of you know about Japanese culture. I'm an expert. But honor and shame are huge parts of it. It's not like it is in America where you can become successful by being an arsehole. If you screw someone over in Japan, you bring shame to yourself. And the only way to get rid of that shame is repentance. What this means is the Japanese public, after hearing about this, is not going to want to purchase Final Fantasy XIII for either system, nor will they purchase any of Square's games. This is huge. <laughs> You can laugh all you want, but Square has alienated an entire market with this move. Square, publicly apologise and cancel Final Fantasy XIII for 360, or you can kiss your business goodbye. Up to that point, Final Fantasy XIII had been considered a de facto exclusive to PlayStation 3, and it was believed that the shift to multi-platform development necessitated the so-called downgrade. While it's possible that it had something to do with this, it's unlikely that a game designed exclusively for the PS3 cell architecture would have performed well with the visuals presented in those earlier screenshots. When Final Fantasy XIII was first demonstrated, hype around the PS3 pegged it as vastly superior to Microsoft's Xbox 360. But by 2008, it was pretty clear that the Xbox 360 is the one that actually had a technical advantage in many third-party games. Even the likes of Naughty Dog never really managed to push the level of character rendering seen in early FF13 assets on PS3 without relying on pre-rendered movies. Though many were indeed fooled into thinking that those uncharted cutscenes were showing off PS3's muscle and the power of exclusivity. On the other hand, additional pre-release materials show that while the graphical complexity was indeed reduced from those initial screenshots, significant work continued to be done to refine the look of the game all throughout the final months of production. Something that became exceptionally clear when examining our first encounter with the actual game. 
Released in the spring of 2009, the Japanese market received a special edition Blu-ray known as Final Fantasy VII Advent Children Complete. This premium package includes both the film, a 2005 expansion on the Final Fantasy VII universe, and a disc featuring a fully playable version of Final Fantasy XIII. The demo contains pretty much the entirety of Chapter 1, but exhibits numerous changes to both its visual design and the gameplay, specifically in regards to the game's battle menu. To understand this, let's start by looking at the final game. Final Fantasy XIII features something known as the Auto Battle option, though it's listed as Attack or Kogeki in the Japanese version. This intelligently selects the best attack combination based on data from that specific foe. There is an option to select your attacks manually, however, but the game is focused on this auto battle option. The multi-part bar above this menu then determines when you can actually attack. We'll discuss more of this in detail later, but these are the basics and the key to understanding the difference here. In the demo version, the main battle menu is instead replaced with just three options, skill, black magic, and white magic. From there, you have the option to attack, manually engage a launcher, use fire or Fyga, or cast a healing spell with white magic. An ATB bar appears beneath each of the characters' names, unlike the final game and more like older games in the series, and executing your selected moves requires you to hit the execute command button right here. Essentially, the battle system requires more input from the user in this demo. The launcher, for instance, is a passive ability that is automatically executed in the final game when enemies are staggered. But in this demo, you can actually use this move at any point, in combination with other attacks. Why did they change it? My guess is that once you get into paradigm shifting, the speed of the battles ramps up significantly, and the more granular menu of the demo may have become overly cumbersome at this point. It is still a curious change, however. Visually, though, there are a ton of improvements between the demo and the final game. Let's start with the introduction. After escaping from the derailed train, we're given our first taste of the real-time graphics in action as Zaz emerges from the wreckage. But before we dive into the actual comparisons, this sequence caught my eye. You know, the one where the camera shows Lightning's face up close. Well, it turns out the demo's actual introduction movie before you begin playing features a pre-rendered recreation of this very moment, something we don't see in the final game. Neat, right? But okay, let's talk about the actual differences here. Now by and large, the basic setup is very similar to the final game as it would ship. It's still 1280 by 720 with 2x MSAA targeting 30 frames per second. But if we look closely, you'll certainly spot numerous changes. Hair, for instance. In the demo, Lightning's hair is displayed almost as if it were a helmet encasing her head. The final game, however, uses a wispy hair shell texture to fill out her stylish do without going over budget on the rendering. Saz's afro also receives proper lighting in the final game versus the somewhat flat appearance in the demo version. Moments later, if we pause the action again, check out the shadow and texture differences here. The normal map used on Lightning's coat is of much lower quality in the demo, while the shadow cast from her arm is of similarly lower resolution compared to the final version. Most of the changes seem to center around these two elements, texture work and shadow quality. I think this scene in particular showcases it best. As Lightning and Zaz make their way to a lower level, let's pause the action and take a closer look. Firstly, perhaps as a result of the painted arrows adorning the ground, the team modified the texture, disabling mip maps on the surface in the final game, while the demo features a very low quality texture filtering resulting in severe blurring. That's not to say texture filtering isn't still a pervasive issue in the final game, of course, but specific surfaces clearly received an extra pass to ensure that it remained reasonably clean. Also, check out the shadows. As we bounce back and forth, note how the demo version renders shadows with a much deeper contrast. It almost kind of resembles something like Doom 3, though using shadow maps rather than stencils, of course. I think the tweaks made to the final game are far more pleasant and natural in this regard. How about another fun difference? Check out Snow's coat in this scene. As the camera pulls back, you'll note that the design adorning the back of his coat has not yet been implemented in the demo. And in another scene, he's missing the chains around his neck too. 
so it's clear that his design was not yet finalized at this point in development. And yeah, by and large, these are the types of changes we observed between that demo and the final game. It's basically down to shadows, lower texture detail, and other minor tweaks to the overall rendering quality. But also, performance. This is one area where Square made dramatic improvements for launch. Using the introductory cutscene as an example, you can clearly see the areas of slowdown from the final game actually tend to run a lot worse in the demo version. It's simply less fluid overall, sometimes to a surprising degree, and it can even slow down in battles. It makes sense given the distance from the final game, of course, but I thought it was interesting to see how things evolved in this sense. Ultimately, the main benefit to this demo centers on production rather than player engagement. In a feature with Game Development Magazine, it was suggested that the need to build this demo helped the team coalesce and begin working together more closely to finalize the game. You get the impression that things were highly fragmented prior to this point, with disparate teams working to build a game that didn't quite yet fit together. This demo helped them find that path. So Final Fantasy XIII did indeed finally release for PlayStation 3 in Japan on December 17th, 2009, and then worldwide for both PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 on March 9th, 2010. The Japanese 360 version would then release almost exactly one year after the PS3 original in December 2010. It was a long road, but the game was finally out there for players to enjoy, or bash I suppose. I and many of my friends really appreciated Final Fantasy XIII for what it was at the time, and we certainly weren't alone in saying that, hey, the battle system here is actually really engaging, and there's nothing wrong with a well-paced linear game, right? But yeah, it was widely perceived as a bit of a dud at the time. So before we go any further into the technical underpinnings of the game, what exactly is Final Fantasy XIII as a game, and why would you want to play it? Whether for the first time, as a replay, or to give it a second chance. So far, so good. They all want to fight. Hey. Good for them. Final Fantasy 13 drops you into the middle of the action quickly with little to no context. It rather infamously relegates much of its backstory into the data log section in the main menu, which you should probably check often on a first playthrough so that you aren't completely lost by why are all these people fighting? What is the Purge? Who are the Sanctum? What's Psycom? What the heck are Cocoon, Pulse, Falsy, Lussy, and so on. As a result, the first one to two hours are a visual spectacle that looks exciting but feels rather superficial with no meaningful gameplay or understanding of the characters to draw you in. Luckily, the core cast is gathered pretty quickly, with one extra introduced later, a la Final Fantasy V, and as soon as a rather explosive event occurs, the five characters can then use magic, having been branded Lussy by a Falsy from the world below, which irrevocably makes them enemies of the state. Okay, maybe that doesn't sound so lucky, but it is, because now the game gets good, or at least I think so. With their Lassi powers, the party now has access to the Paradigm and Crystarium systems, which make up the core of the gameplay's primary combat and character development mechanics. Paradigms are a set of rules that define each character's role in combat. There are six roles in total, but early on, each character has access to only two or three predetermined roles that they're more specialized in. These roles are very similar to jobs from other Final Fantasy games, but with a highly specific purpose in combat, such as attacking, defending, healing, buffing, or debuffing. You can customize the different role sets for your current party and then shift between those paradigms at any point during combat by pressing L1 or LB. Final Fantasy XIII is the game that introduced the Stagger system, which has seemingly become a series mainstay, with it also appearing in Final Fantasy XV and VII Remake. This lets you push a chain meter ever higher, which boosts your damage against an enemy by a certain percentage, and opens the enemy up to extremely high damage for a period of time after the Stagger threshold is crossed. 
Something the game should probably explain more clearly is that the Ravager roll is your main means of pushing the chain gauge higher, but Ravager attacks also speed up the rate that it falls, risking a reset to zero. So you need to offset this with commando or saboteur attacks, which barely bump the gauge, but help stabilize it so that you can continue pushing it toward the stagger threshold. One divisive aspect is the auto battle command that the cursor defaults to each turn. But this is perhaps a bit of a messaging flub that has led to common perception that Final Fantasy XIII basically plays itself. Now, a lot of people do enjoy auto battle functions in series such as Dragon Quest or Breath of Fire, letting regular encounters play out mindlessly while taking boss battles more seriously, and it's totally okay to play that way, of course. But speaking for myself, I tend not to use these functions too often because I prefer to stay engaged and make decisions myself, even through regular encounters in RPGs. But if we examine the Japanese version of Final Fantasy XIII, the item marked Auto Battle in English is actually just Kogeki, as I mentioned earlier, which just means attack, something you'll see used in other menu-driven RPGs. However, it is true that selecting this regardless of what it is called does queue up a series of commands without the need to directly select each ability, which you can do if you have a need to, but it's inefficient in most scenarios. However, it only queues up optimal abilities if you learn more about each enemy through fighting or using the Libra ability, which used to be called Scan back in the day. But here's the thing, no matter what Auto Battle or Kogeki is called and what it does, Final Fantasy XIII requires you to be engaged through regular encounters and boss battles alike. If you only play the first several chapters, I could see how you might come to the conclusion that you don't have to intervene terribly often, but the game isn't so much about what specific attacks you're doing and more about the timing of when to press forward with the attack, back off, defend, heal, buff up, etc. You shouldn't really be thinking so much about the auto battle command and focus more on the paradigm shift system, which is the key to having fun and being successful in combat. The game is often quite challenging and its general linearity means that difficult fights through most of the game really do need to be overcome with strategy rather than just grinding. Of course, the Japanese version actually has the option to play in easy mode if you choose, something that was removed from the Western release. So yeah, in practice, the so-called auto battle function doesn't turn Final Fantasy into a game where you can just burn through everything with minimum input, regardless of whether that's what you wanted or not. And there clearly was a lot of thought poured into how enemies are placed throughout the maps, introducing simple encounters early on in an area while gradually upping the ante and mixing up enemy lineups over the course of the chapter. As far as we've noticed, each enemy visible roaming nearby will appear in combat upon contact, with no additional unseen enemies added at the start of any fight. Think about that, virtually every individual enemy you fight on the battle screen is placed, doing something in the field as well. That's some nice attention to detail that you rarely, if ever, saw in other RPGs where visible encounters with a single enemy often led to combat on a separate screen with many more enemies than you actually saw in the field. Outside of combat though, yes, the game is indeed relentlessly linear, especially for the first roughly 30 hours, but it's not literally just running straight down hallways as people say. I mean, there are side paths all over the place where you'll find treasure or be able to take a detour around a strong monster or something like that, but most of the time there's little danger of you becoming lost or turned around. But I will admit, as much as I don't mind the linearity, John and I agree that most areas in the game would have benefited from being maybe 20% shorter, but for the most part, I think the pacing throughout each area, or dungeon if you will, is reasonably solid with well-designed and varied enemy encounters throughout. And honestly, I don't think that the linear areas are all that different from the simplistic maps of the much more widely loved Final Fantasy X in practice, but given that Final Fantasy XIII launched at a different time to an audience that was enamored and excited by the possibilities of open worlds, this approach drew a veritable deluge of criticism. The latter quarter or so of the game opens up considerably with the open wilds of Grand Pulse, where you can go well off the beaten path and do much more if you so wish. 
One thing that's so interesting to me about Grand Pulse is that literally all of the game's side quests exist in this region. And since you can return to Grand Pulse even after you've entered the final dungeon, it's impossible to block yourself out of 100%ing the game or getting all of the achievements. I mean, at the time, a JRPG with no missables was something that you'd almost never see. But the rest of the game is so streamlined, in fact, that towns and NPC conversations in the traditional sense are things that functionally don't exist aside from a few token moments, such as this brief flashback to the town of Bodum that takes place prior to the game's opening. Toriyama is on the record saying that they tried and couldn't make the towns live up to the visual quality of the rest of the game, but this is a bit strange because if you look at the entertainment center of Nautilus, I mean, it has all the makings of a town, minus the ability to actually interact with the NPCs. So John and I were speculating that perhaps what Toriyama was trying to avoid was the need to have a sort of B or C tier cutscene format that would include interactions with everyday low polygon NPCs that don't look as fabulous as the main cast. You know what I mean, right? How most AAA games, including Final Fantasy XIII sequels, have key story scenes fully voiced with elaborate choreography and camera angles, while less important moments and side quests might use canned animations and simple camera angles, often mixing high fidelity player characters with more mundane NPCs. So it seems like the goal with Final Fantasy XIII was to look beautiful at all times, and it's likely that NPC interactions were at odds with that standard, hence the side quest being received from Seath Stones that used to be humans, as opposed to talking to actual people. And later on in the video, we will look into the performance metrics of the Final Fantasy XIII sequels, which were also built with crystal tools, but do feature towns full of bumbling NPCs, and, well, it does perhaps provide insight into the challenges that they were facing when building the first game. But regardless of whether the lack of towns was driven more by technology, budget, or game design, I did find this to be a refreshing and daring experiment in seeing if it was okay to strip a seemingly sacred element out of the JRPG. I mean, be honest with yourself. Is systematically talking to every NPC in every town and every game actually fun? Is it fun to then check them a second time to make sure that they don't say something different when you talk to them twice? It's something that I tolerate because I love RPGs, but often it's not fun at all. It's an obligation, something that we do out of a sense of duty to ensure that we don't miss anything. But perhaps Final Fantasy XIII did go just a bit too far with its near total abolition of towns, but it did lay the groundwork for the game that has possibly my favorite implementation of towns and NPCs in an RPG to date, Final Fantasy VII Remake. I know that all anyone remembers is how generic the FF7 Remake NPCs look, but that's not what I'm talking about here. See, there are moments throughout Final Fantasy XIII where your party passes by run-of-the-mill citizens, but instead of actively clicking on them to make them say anything, they just muse to themselves or talk to one another as a group, dropping similar world and atmosphere building tidbits that they might do in any other RPG. So clearly, Tetsuya Nomura and his team thought that this was one aspect of Final Fantasy XIII that shouldn't be thrown away, because Final Fantasy VII Remake uses this to great effect. The slums of Midgar feel appropriately bustling and full of people who have things to say, but you absorb it passively via spoken dialogue and a visible text log as you run through town, with the only NPCs you actively click on being the actual important or functional ones. This feels so much more natural and less tedious and is absolutely the way forward for RPG towns and NPCs in my opinion. Well, all right, so like it or not, that's pretty much Final Fantasy XIII in a nutshell. It's a beautiful linear game with exciting combat, an incredible soundtrack, and admittedly, not one of the better stories in the series in my opinion at least. So. Now, it's time to examine how well all of this is propped up by the Crystal Tools engine. It's fair 
to say that, at least as of the seventh entry, the Final Fantasy series has widely become known for its visual splendor, pushing technology and art design to new heights. Final Fantasy XIII certainly satisfies this criteria with its richly detailed characters and beautifully rendered environments, but it's equally evident in its limited design that the road to release was long and fraught with trouble. As noted earlier, Final Fantasy XIII was created using a set of tools and technology known as Crystal Tools. At its core, the idea of building an expansive middleware toolkit for multiple game projects makes a lot of sense, and it is in fact the future we enjoy today. But getting it off the ground required more time and effort than initially expected, delaying the release of the game. By the time Final Fantasy XIII launched, it was clear that the original vision had been pared back slightly. The visuals on display are still phenomenally detailed for this era, but compared to those earlier shots I mentioned, detail is clearly pared back. But that's okay, because it really does look great in the end, I think. When assessing the visuals though, there's multiple angles to consider here. The character rendering, the environment design, user interface, and even things like how the FMV and loading screens are handled. All of these elements coalesce into a complete package that remains remarkably attractive even today. Characters are hugely important to a Final Fantasy game. Ever since Final Fantasy X, I'd argue, the series has relied on cinematic cutscenes for storytelling and Final Fantasy XIII pushes this beyond just about anything Square had released in the past, with an enormous number of very stylishly directed sequences. The game features a mix of real-time scenes, high-end CGI sequences, and video-based sequences derived from the real-time engine. You stay here. So sorry. I didn't mean to. These people need heroes. The cast of Final Fantasy XIII is expressive and rich in detail, perhaps not so much in terms of raw polygon counts, rather with the amount of detail that is conveyed using a modest polygon budget. Edges on things such as jewelry, clothing, and hair are all plainly evident if you look, but step back and I think you'll find that it holds up surprisingly well. Remember, this was the era of the bald space marine, those muddy, normal map encrusted characters that were so common in the AAA space during this era really failed to hold a candle to Final Fantasy XIII's stunning character designs, I think. While modern techniques were employed, including things like normal maps, I feel that the artists managed to create something really special here. The Modeling work is really good and among the best of any game released during this era of consoles. This is further enhanced through the copious amount of dangly bits and other secondary animation work featured throughout the game. It really helps bring each character to life. Hair rendering is perhaps a little overambitious, with obvious dithering patterns as a result of the alpha to coverage technique made possible when using MSAA. Alpha to coverage is basically a coverage mask rather than a true alpha blending technique. It speeds up the process at the expense of quality, but it still looks pretty good in the end. The most striking aspect of the presentation, however, lies in the environments themselves. Most of Final Fantasy XIII's environments certainly make an impression and are a huge part of why the visuals have aged as well as they have. Nearly every area is visually striking, feeling almost like concept art sprung to life. The world of Cocoon is as beautiful as it is abstract. The floating walkways of Hanging Edge precariously dangling around the otherworldly Foul Sea is a sight to behold, as is the temple-like design of the Foul Sea itself. When the crew is then cursed during the finale of Chapter 2, a blast of energy sends the entirety of the Hanging Edge crashing down into Lake Brescia. With one blast of light, everything turns to crystal, just as it smashes into the water below. The results are these gorgeous waves and formations frozen in time. This makes up the environment you'll explore throughout Chapter 3. I really think this specific area really demonstrates what I love so much about Final Fantasy XIII's environments, the fantastical worlds you'll explore. Glancing out across the map, you're often presented with areas that almost defy logic, and yet it's so captivating. Then there's the Gapra Whitewood, with its pulsating mechanical plant life encircling the elevated walkways. It's a beautiful, mysterious place packed with excellent texture work and stunning vistas. And of course, after this, you'll visit the Sunleth Waterscape, with its lush greenery, 
This is the same location that was teased in the game's very first trailer, in fact, and it looks really comparable, I think. What's interesting about this chapter, though, is the inclusion of a weather shifting function. You can basically toggle between stormy or sunny weather conditions. It's kind of a gimmick, but it's a neat one nonetheless. One particularly unusual sight, though, that is easily overlooked is the subtle upward curvature of the ocean visible toward the horizon at the outskirts of Palumpolum. It's a nice touch that helps sell the concept of Cocoon as a world on the inside of a planetoid with an artificial sun and atmosphere at its center. Each chapter features a uniquely crafted environment packed full of detail and stunning design. While the worlds you explore are indeed exceptionally creative on the face of it, there is truth to the complaints regarding linearity. Most areas are indeed relatively narrow in design, and there's a sense that, in pursuit of these high-end visuals, size and scope had to be sacrificed. The one exception to this is, of course, Chapter 11, the point in which you arrive on Grand Pulse. A world wild and fragile, vibrant and untamed. Grand Pulse. Following an explosive chapter finale, the crew finds themselves on the surface of Grand Pulse. With this transition, Final Fantasy XIII shifts from a tight linear experience to a large-scale outdoor adventure. With the shadow of Cocoon looming in the distance, Grand Pulse represents a dramatic shift in the tone and design of the game. One reminiscent of leaving Midgar for the first time back in Final Fantasy VII, only it occurs much later in the game. During your time on Grand Pulse, you'll accept quests from Seath Stones, level up your party for later challenges, and take on gigantic monsters across the field. One thing's for sure, it handily demonstrates what Crystal Tools is capable of when rendering a larger environment, but simultaneously reveals its limitations. Relatively sparse open fields, minimal foliage, and distracting enemy pop-in are all present, something that occurs nowhere else in the game, really. Even still, the sense of scale is very impressive, and it offers a nice change of pace in terms of gameplay. Taken together then, the environments featured throughout Final Fantasy XIII impress and delight. Even at its most linear, the game showcases a range of color and design far exceeding the typical earthy brown tones so common this generation. The use of color throughout the game is simply spectacular. These beautiful worlds all come alive with the highest quality animation work in series history, at least as of its release date. The basic run cycle feels remarkably satisfying, and the animation featured during the game's many real-time battles is also top tier. Everything has this super fluid, smooth appearance and motion that I simply adore. It looks great even now. Furthermore, the game features a curious camera system that feels like a hybrid between a predefined cinematic camera and a right stick adjustable free cam. The way it smoothly tracks your characters while attempting to dynamically frame every shot really lends the game an extra cinematic flair. Even better, in many scenes throughout the story, the game will dynamically transition directly from a cutscene into the battle, like this. The way it combines the storytelling, the music, and this smooth transition directly into the fight really gets you excited to take on whatever creature you're facing off against. Our turn, hero. What? I can handle a little gas. Catch your breath. I'll throw in some hits for you. That said, most battles still take place on separate maps, like this, but at least the loading in and out of battle is handled extremely quickly. Now, as we alluded to earlier in the video, I do think Square was so focused on ensuring that Final Fantasy XIII was as beautiful as possible all the time, that it may have limited the overall scope of the game, and kind of explains why it's mostly very, very linear. In that sense, it's an interesting example of what's possible when maximum resources are spent on ensuring the presentation is virtually pristine from start to finish. In that sense, I can certainly respect it. But another aspect I should touch on as well includes the excellent user interface, the smooth transitions between screens, complete with short video snippets like this. 
the animation work on the little selector bubbles, the beautifully designed Crystarium that you navigate while upgrading your character, or even just the game's battle menu all look excellent. Remember, as an RPG, most of your interactions, at least outside of character movement, are done using a menu system, so it's extra important to get it right, and get it right they did. Even loading screens are handled smartly. This generation represented a huge leap in terms of the amount of data that needed to be loaded into memory when you played the game, and on PS3 at least, you couldn't actually install the game, it ran from the Blu-ray disc. The game displays a moderately lengthy loading screen like this, complete with an event summary, but once you're actually in the game, the rest of the experience is mostly seamless with only these short dips to black and very occasional quick loading screens. This is most likely the reason for using video sequences for certain scenes. They can load game data in the background while the scene plays out. Either way, from its characters to its environments, interface design, and beyond, Final Fantasy XIII is one of those experiences that definitely uh, flaunts its budget, so to speak. For 2010, it was one of the most impressive games on the market from a pure visual perspective, and I'd argue it holds up extremely well today, exceeding many games released on consoles such as the Nintendo Switch. I think a lot of it hinges on its conservative use of modern rendering features, as I alluded to earlier. You know, things like shadow maps and normal maps are still there, but they're always used very tastefully and contrasted against more tried and true techniques. The artwork just really shines through in the end. Now given all of this though, perhaps it's time to discuss the game's various ports and conversions. Final Fantasy XIII was designed primarily for the PlayStation 3, but it also arrived on Xbox 360 and eventually the PC. It even supports backwards compatibility mode on modern Xbox consoles, further enhancing the experience, something I've covered in the past. When examining each version, there's basically three key areas of differentiation between them. Resolution, frame rate, and full motion video quality. Now, resolution-wise, the PlayStation 3 version runs at 1280x720, but supports upscaling to 1080p, something which does have actual benefits when it comes to its full motion video playback, which we'll discuss momentarily. Xbox 360, on the other hand, operates at just 1024x576. Both utilize 2x MSAA, but I wonder if the developers were relying on tiling with the 360 version resulting in this lower resolution, though in that case you'd think 4x MSAA would have been possible. It's a curious difference when you consider the strengths of the Xbox 360's GPU. It does kind of suggest that this game was created on a much shorter timescale for Xbox. PS3 certainly offers superior image quality overall with cleaner edges and superior hair coverage, but it certainly looks nice enough on the 360, even at this lower resolution. Where it differs most significantly though is in the FMV quality. Final Fantasy XIII relies very heavily on video clips, and on PlayStation 3 there's no issue here. Square uses very high bitrate videos throughout the game, no doubt made possible thanks to the Blu-ray format. Even better, all of the pre-rendered CGI sequences are displayed at Full HD 1080p, which look phenomenal. But for some reason, when porting the game to Xbox 360, rather than using a higher quality H.264 based codec or something like that, they opted instead to recompress everything using Bink Video, and oh boy, is the quality low. Let's queue up a comparison here during the introduction movie. I'll pause the action for a second. If we then zoom the camera here into this shot, you should notice some additional macro blocking and loss of clarity on the Xbox 360 side as a result of the low bitrate. Given that it ships on three discs on Xbox 360, it's obvious that space was a real issue, but I think they could have done a better job with video compression here. As it stands, given the amount of video in the game, it's kind of a problem for the overall presentation. Frame rate wise both target 30 frames per second, but dips in performance vary significantly between the two platforms, suggesting very different bottlenecks. GPU-heavy real-time cutscenes, for instance, seem to push the PlayStation 3 over the edge, with frame drops often appearing during character close-ups specifically. Xbox 360, on the other hand, fares a lot better in this regard, maintaining the target 30 frames per second with relative ease. While playing through Final Fantasy XIII, you'll spend a decent amount of time watching these cutscenes, and whenever a real-time sequence is used, you can be sure that slowdown will be more common and apparent on the PlayStation 3. 
Given the state of frame rates during this era though, I'd say it's not that distracting, but it is definitely an advantage in favor of 360. Fortunately, when playing, performance is a lot more consistent across both platforms. Battles play out smoothly at 30 frames per second, or at least as smooth as 30 frames per second can be, with only an occasional hint of slowdown like this scene here on the Xbox 360. Again though, the PS360 generation is so well known for low frame rates that the stability here is kind of impressive given the quality of the graphics on display. Outside of higher end first party projects, such fluidity was often not observed. Furthermore, as we'll see later in the video, the original Final Fantasy XIII is easily the most stable of the trilogy, neatly dodging any real nasty slowdown like we see in those games. That is, with one major exception. While the game generally seems to perform slightly better on Xbox 360 throughout most of the game, once you arrive on Grand Pulse, the result is reversed. Suddenly, just running across the open landscape is enough to trigger dips into the mid-twenties on the Xbox, whereas the PS3 hums along without issue, delivering a stable 30 frames per second. I'm really not entirely sure where the bottleneck on 360 lies. After all, it's not like there's much happening on the screen. It is larger than anything else in the game, but ultimately pretty sparse. Either way, it's the one area where the PS Triple comes out ahead performance-wise. Looking at both versions, I'd have to give the PS3 version the overall advantage. It looks slightly better, features much better FMV, and runs well enough, I'd say. It's pretty obvious that this is the version that Square poured most of its time and money into. But there are other options available today. Firstly, there's the backwards compatibility feature on modern Xbox consoles. I discussed this in a proper video in great detail in the past, but the gist here is simple. Final Fantasy XIII receives multiple improvements that differ based on which Xbox you're using, but it elevates all of them. So on Xbox One X or the Xbox Series X, the internal resolution is boosted significantly from 576p all the way up to 3072 by 1728 Of course, the video you're watching right now is rendered just at 1080p, so you won't see all of the pixels, but the downsampling benefits should be plainly obvious. It's much cleaner than any original version of the game. It also runs better, with all of the performance hiccups completely eliminated. It's now a completely steady 30 frames per second throughout. And yes, this includes all of the areas on Grand Pulse, which struggled to run well on Xbox 360, but deliver a perfect 30 frames per second and much sharper visuals on the Series X here. This is definitely a much better experience all around. If you're on Xbox Series S then, you get a 2x increase on each axis, bringing it up to 2048 by 1152, which is a lot sharper. Xbox One and Xbox One S then run at the original 576p, but receive improved performance like all the others. The most significant improvement though, I might argue, stems from the FMV sequences, which were re-encoded at a much higher quality. They're still using Bink Video, of course, and not quite a match for PS3, but they're very, very close now, and it's no longer a real issue. Unfortunately, FF13 never received support for an increased frame rate like the sequels did so you're stuck at 30 frames per second. But still, with these improvements, it's basically the best way to enjoy the game on a modern platform. Then of course we have the PC version. Released several years later, the PC release is widely considered a mediocre port, but there are ways to massively improve it in the modern era. So by default, the game runs with a double buffer V-Sync, meaning if you can't hold 60 FPS, your frame rate will drop all the way back to 30 instead. At the time, tools were available to overcome this, of course, but they also created problems with cutscene playback. Thankfully, it's now 2022, and using more modern, powerful PCs, it's pretty easy to just blitz right through this and enjoy the game at a stable 60 frames per second. In fact, it's the only way to play Final Fantasy XIII above 30 FPS. The only downside to this is that it creates an unfortunate contrast between the pre-rendered movie scenes and the gameplay. The videos are 30 FPS, obviously, and lower resolution, while the gameplay can run at 60 FPS instead. Still, I think it's worth enjoying it at the higher frame rate. It also features higher resolution shadows, and you can force 16x AF from your GPU control panel too, something the Xbox versions enjoy as well. 
Honestly, playing it on a modern PC, it feels excellent. There are occasional minor visual bugs, of course, such as the Z fighting evident in certain scenes like this, but by and large, it looks great and is super sharp. It's really a joy seeing the game run at a smooth 60 frames per second, especially in the beautifully directed real-time cutscenes. Plus, that higher resolution and high levels of anisotropic filtering certainly help in areas like this, which can appear otherwise muddy, I think. Compared to the PlayStation 3 original, I think you can appreciate the improvements on offer here. Everything is sharper, cleaner, and runs smoother, just as you'd expect from a PC release. Though in reality, it looks very similar to the backwards compatible enhanced Xbox version, just at a higher frame rate. In fact, the only real problem here is that by default, the FMV quality is very poor, much like the 360 original. But this is the PC, my friends, not a console, which opens the door for mods. Want higher quality FMV? You can do it. Want to improve those visuals or modify the gameplay? Yep, of course it's possible. One of my favorite mods is this one, the HD Models Plus. This updates the game to use the highest quality character models throughout the entire game. That means both in cutscenes and gameplay. It looks dramatically better, I think, with a much higher polygon count. So let's compare, shall we? Now, at first glance, it may not actually seem like a huge difference. I mean, yes, if you look carefully, you should spot the extra detail in each of these scenes, and it looks perceptually great, right? But it's only when you pause the action that you really can appreciate those extra details, so check it out. The difference in detail here is simply astounding. Increased polygon counts, improved textures, and higher quality hair rendering are all included here on these main characters. Let's check out another scene then. The same improvements are clear as day, aren't they? It actually feels completely authentic and natural in action as well. Of course, this only applies to the main characters, not secondary or tertiary characters, but still, I think it's pretty awesome. There's an even more robust HD pack available as well, if you like, which further alters the game. The point is, the PC version looks fantastic and is probably the single best version of Final Fantasy XIII if you have a decent PC and some of these mods installed. The only real downside remaining here is some weird technical hiccups. 1440p scaling seems completely messed up, FMV playback is not as smooth as it should be, and it's very light on options. Otherwise, it's darn good, provided your PC is up to the task, of course. Another version of the game was also released on the Windows Store, though, and there was talk about it being improved through the porting company Virtuous. But from what I can tell, it still shares most of the issues with the Steam version and you can't use mods with it, making it kind of a poor choice in the grand scheme of things. That, however, is pretty much what you can expect across the various versions of Final Fantasy XIII, but whichever version you play, I think it's pretty clear that the game holds up exceptionally well. Ultimately, what I love about XIII's presentation is its highly coherent and polished appearance. Lacking things such as screen space artifacts, temporal instability, or other modern nitpicks, Final Fantasy XIII almost feels like a fusion between these old and new rendering techniques polished up to perfection. It holds up a lot better than most other games released during this period. One of Final Fantasy XIII's defining elements, though, is almost certainly its soundtrack. Crafted by the legendary and slightly underrated Masashi Hamauzu, Final Fantasy XIII represents his first shot at scoring a mainline title in the series, and boy does he knock it out of the park. The melodies are equally beautiful and catchy.
But one of my favorites has to be the boss battle theme, which for my money is one of the absolute best boss battle themes in Final Fantasy series history. Take a listen. From its visuals, the gameplay, storytelling, and audio design, Final Fantasy XIII is streamlined and beautifully crafted from start to finish. While the limitations are clear, hopefully by now you've gained a new appreciation for what Final Fantasy XIII brings to the table, and perhaps give it another shot. And while Fabula Nova Crystallis perhaps didn't play out as intended, Final Fantasy XIII did receive a pair of sequels, which is exactly what we'll discuss next time on DF Retro. You see, in part two of our Final Fantasy XIII retrospective, My Life in Gaming's Mark Triforce Duddleson explores the two sequels. Curious how they hold up? Then be sure to tune in next time to find out.